Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'd like to take a moment and uh, reflect on one of my favorite passages in the scriptures, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Uh, this is a poem, uh, a song of sorts, that <clears throat> we have uh, recorded for us in Paul's letter to the Colossians, focusing on Jesus. Uh, at the beginning of the letter to the Colossian Christians, Paul sees fit to bring in this poem that either he composed or someone composed or he adapted uh, or he composed for this very purpose uh, in order to uh, exalt Jesus and show the C Colossian Christians that Jesus is uh, above all. He is preeminent. He is supreme in certain specific ways. Uh, and as we look at this poem, I want you to kind of pay attention to the things that Paul says uh, in connection to all or everything. All things or everything, he mentions several times in this poem, uh, centering everything and all things around Jesus. Uh, and I think it's helpful for us to kind of remember if we're going to keep the main thing the main thing uh, in this uh, season of uh, stress and pressure and even distraction, we can get our priorities all out of whack. And Paul uh, would have us keep Jesus as the center uh, and remember that he is the focus of our lives and the focus of history even. Uh, so all that's going on right now is for Jesus in some fashion. So let's see what Paul says and let's unpack this beautiful uh, poem that's here. <clears throat> starting in Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So, it's important to focus in on what Paul uh, says here in this poem, how he highlights the greatness, the supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus himself. The first word, he, is uh, how he starts this poem. In Greek, it's the pronoun who, a relative pronoun that focuses back. This is the way uh, poetic uh, praises of high people or high gods was often done. It would start with this relative pronoun, who, and the pronoun goes back to specifically the mention of the beloved son at the end of verse 13. So that's who we're talking about, the beloved son of God. That's who the poem is about, the beloved son of God. He is the image of the invisible God. So what does that mean? Well, Pastor Ken uh, showed us a video and talked a bit about what it means to be made in the image of God. And he pointed a bit, and the video pointed to how Jesus is the ultimate image of God. Uh, this is a human characteristic. God made humanity as the image of God. Humanity rebelled, and that image was uh, fractured. Uh, think of a mirror and what happens when it is broken. You can still see a reflection, truly enough, but it's cracked and distorted. And that's the way humanity today images God. We are broken reflections of our great God. We do not mirror him accurately. We're twisted distortions of our great God. Jesus is not. He is not fractured in, in himself. He does not bear the marks of the fall in his own nature. And so he is the pure, undiluted, undistorted, untwisted, unbroken image of the invisible God. And so what Paul wants us to see here is if we want to see God, you need to look at Jesus, the man. Jesus, the man, shows us who God is. We can see him uh, by the way he's presented to us in the scriptures as a human. 
And so the beloved son is the image of the invisible God. He is the way that we can see God. Next, he says that he is the firstborn of all creation. In the early church, after the New Testament was completed, this statement, this phrase, created a lot of debate. Uh, some of the greatest and most complicated debates in the early church centered around this phrase, firstborn of all creation. The question uh, was posed as, as though Paul might be saying that Jesus, uh, that the Son of God was created. He was the first of uh, the first, uh, first person, first being, first thing that God created, but he's a created being. But that, of course, is not what's Paul, what Paul is saying. That comes from two things, two misunderstandings of this phrase. The first misunderstanding is the significance of the term firstborn. Its primary significance is not about sequence. It rather, in the ancient world, uh, a firstborn son has the inheritance right. And as you can see plainly, if you just read the scriptures, even just read the book of Genesis, you can tell that sometimes the rights of the firstborn don't go to the sequential firstborn, right? Think of the 12 sons of uh, Jacob. Uh, his, the firstborn inheritance rights were actually shifted around a couple of times. Or think maybe more, e more easily and more simply, Jacob and Esau, the two twins, uh, and the way that their birth was uh, handled, and then Esau, the one who truly was firstborn, gave his right of firstborn inheritance away to his brother Jacob. And so the, the aspect of Jesus being firstborn of all creation has to do, first of all, with his rights of inheritance. And so what Paul is saying on the one hand is that Jesus, the beloved son, has the right of inheritance of all creation. That is to say, all creation is his right of his inheritance as a firstborn son of God. But secondly, the little, phrase, the little word of is misunderstood. Now, it's ambiguous, right? It could go multiple ways, but when we take account of the rest of Scripture, we cannot conclude what our Jehovah's Witnesses, our Jehovah's Witness friends and uh, the Mormons, uh, for example, in modern day terms, conclude that Jesus is a created being, that the Son of God is a created being, and he was uh, not always in existence. Instead, this phrase, firstborn of all creation, can mean firstborn over all creation. Uh, see, the firstborn son, if he is a king, and in verse 13, he is spoken of as having a kingdom, the kingdom of his beloved son, then what is his realm? Well, his realm is all creation. He is the rightful ruler over all creation, and he's the rightful ruler because he's the firstborn son. God is the rightful ruler of all creation because he created it, and he has handed over the rule to all cre of all creation to his son, to his beloved son. And so his uh, firstborn status is being highlighted here, that he's the rightful ruler and inheritor of all creation. Paul elaborates on that reality in verse 16, for... By him, all things were created. So how is it that this son has the right to rule over all creation? Well, he was involved in creation, that's how. And so here we get an immediate statement that corrects the misunderstanding of the previous phrase. If all things were created by him, then he himself must not be created. Uh, that excludes him from someone or something that was created. By him, all things were created. All things. There's nothing uh, left out in that phrase, in this context. For, all thing, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth. So if you were wondering, all things in heaven and all things on earth. So that encompasses everything in the universe. Um, visible and invisible. Again, another way of encompassing everything. Everything you can see and everything you cannot see. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Paul focuses in on these Thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. These are spiritual powers in Paul's understanding. These are the um, angelic beings, both fallen and good, who have some kind of cosmic authority over the universe. You can read about some of that in Deuteronomy 32, for example. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, I think it is, where God delegates authority over the nations to angelic powers, to the sons of God. And uh, there's some discussion about that. Some of our versions read it according to the number of the sons of Israel, but the uh, 
Hebrew original is pretty clearly the sons of God, which is probably a reference to angelic beings. And so that's an interesting teaching that doesn't get a lot of press these days, but it's the reality that God has delegated authority over the nations to angelic powers, uh, and that we, we get glimpses of that in certain places in Scripture, like in the book of Daniel, uh, where we're introduced to this, this angelic prince of Greece, uh, and the prince of Persia, these heavenly beings who have some measure of authority over what goes on in individual nations. That goes back to Deuteronomy 32, uh, first and foremost. But even them, even the authorities were created by God with the Son's involvement. And he elaborates on that involvement in the next phrase at the end of verse 16. All things were created through him and for him. So God the Father is the primary impetus of creation, and he works through his Son. Now, how that looked in the original creation, we have no knowledge. Uh, the scriptures don't elaborate on those details. Uh, in some fashion, we could imagine the mind of God the Father planning the whole thing out, and the execution of the plan, the actual bringing forth into being all that exists as we see narrated for us in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, when God speaks, the word with which he speaks is the word that we know of as the Son of God. And so some mysterious uh, Trinitarian work was involved in creation. And here Paul is acknowledging that reality that the Son is the, the means through which the God accomplishes and brought into being all that exists. But not just that, the Son is not only the means through which God uh, exercised his power to bring everything into existence that exists, but also everything that exists, exists for him, for his glory, for his reputation, for his pleasure. Uh, God created as a, a gift for his son, you might say, an inheritance that was to be passed on to his son, something that his son could enjoy. Uh, we're stretching the bounds of our knowledge here from what the scriptures tell us about creation. But uh, the key, the, 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 metaphorical, the metaphorical reality of a father doing something for the purpose of his son's enjoyment is the reality that we're talking about here, that Paul is touching on. We are in the very mysteries of the plan of God in creation. And so everything that exists, everything in the heavens, everything on the earth, everything in the universe exists to bring glory and enjoyment and pleasure to the Son of God. Everything was made, created for him. In verse 17, he continues this thread of Jesus' preeminence above all things and everything being directed to and pointed toward him. He is before all things. Now that could be a reference to the Son of God's preexistence, that he was there before it all came into being. Or it's simply to say everything exists under his purview, under his watchful eye. He is before all things, meaning he's standing here and everything else is out in front of him and or behind him as it were or underneath him he, he's cast his gaze over all that exists there's nothing that's outside of the eye or the control of this great king the son of god he is before all things and in him this is the most magnificent phrase in all of this poem in him all things hold together if Jesus, if the Son of God, let's say it this way, if the Son of God were to loosen his grip, the universe would cease to exist. Everything would fall apart. The very existence that we know of, from the very physicality of the universe, the atoms, the molecules, the, every part of the universe, the only reason it functions is because the Son of God is holding it together. This is a remarkable statement. In him, in connection to him, by his power, by his decree, uh, all things hold together. All things keep functioning. All things stay where they're supposed to be uh, 
and they will continue to do so as long as he continues to hold them together. So we are very, our very existence and everything's very existence from the greatest angel to the most magnificent star in the universe to the tiniest organism on this planet. It all holds together and remains in existence because Jesus is holding it together. The Son of God is holding together everything. Everything that's going on right now, even the, the emergence of this virus and the situation that we're in, the governments of the world and all that they're trying to do, all of it is being held in place and continued moving forward because of the Son of God. All of it, every bit of it is being held together, held in place, continued in its existence and in its movement because he is holding it together according to his purposes, according to his timeline, and according to his power. And so he is the one who determines all these things. He is the one who we should be putting our hope in for things to change or for things to end. And so we turn our attention to Jesus because of this. Now verse 18 takes a shift. He's been talking cosmically and globally where all things everywhere in all the universe are connected to Jesus, but now he shifts his attention to Jesus' connection specifically with his people, with the church, the assembly of God's people. And this is the way he puts it together. He is the head of the body, the church. And so we're familiar with this metaphor from Paul that Jesus, the Son of God, is the head of a, of a body, and the church is the body that's attached to the head. And the head is what gives guidance and rules over and shapes the experience of the body. And so Paul is highlighting that point right here. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, by saying he's the beginning, he's talking about him being the beginning of the church. But more than that, he's actually talking about, Jesus, talking about Jesus being the beginning of a new creation, which is the, the uh, reality of the church. The church is the people of the new creation. We still live in the old creation, but as Paul says elsewhere, when, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that's you and me, as we trust in Jesus, we, we are created as a new being for a new world. We are citizens of the new creation already. And so Jesus is the beginning of that. He is the beginning as he was involved in the creation of the original creation in the beginning of Genesis chapter 1. So also he is the beginning of the new creation which started with his death and resurrection. His resurrection in particular which is mentioned here. And he is the firstborn from the dead. And again that aspect of firstborn it can be sequence and so it is in this particular case. But the significance is that he is the preeminent one. He is the great one. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the one to whom resurrection belongs. And because he is the first one to experience it in this particular case. That, notice that, that's a purpose. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So what's the point of his resurrection here? The resurrection of Jesus was so that... In everything, he might be preeminent. In everything, he might be preeminent. So his resurrection demonstrates his preeminence in everything. So he is supreme. He is ultimate. He is primary. He is all in all, as Paul will say later in Colossians 3. And so here we have him focused in his resurrection being the very beginning of the life of the church, the existence of his body is rooted and connected to his resurrection from the dead as the firstborn. Now verses 19 and 20 is a very complicated sentence, and most of our English Bibles don't make it easier for us, and sometimes we can miss the significance of what's being said here. Note that he begins with this phrase, in him, for in him. So what is, what's the significance of his preeminence? His preeminence is because in him... All the fullness of God was pleased. So stop there for just a minute. All the fullness of God. So all that God is, his fullness, all that God is as he exists, 
was pleased to do two things. Now, the way our English Bibles have this, the first thing is very far separated from the second thing, and we can lose sight of the connection here. But the fullness of God, God's whole self, everything that God is, was pleased, delighted to do two things. One, to dwell in Him. For in Him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So the man Jesus, who walked around in this world for 33 years, everything that God is, was pleased to dwell in the man Jesus. And so this is speaking to the mysterious hypostatic union. That's the theological term that gets thrown around. The union of the two natures of Jesus, his human nature and his divine nature. All that God is dwelt in the physical, limited, human body of Jesus. Crazy to think about how that might work. But Paul tells us that that's the truth. Everything that God is was in the man Jesus. And he was pleased to be there. It wasn't a sacrifice for God to do this. It wasn't painful for him. It was a delight for God to take up residence in a human body. It was a delight of God to come into this world and become one of us and come among us. It was his delight. He was pleased to do it. But he was pleased to do a second thing, and this is where Paul's really focusing in verse 20. And through him, through the Son of God, the fullness of God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. So the second thing that God was delighted to do, pleased to do, was to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. So how did reconciliation happen? How did God make peace with all things and for all things? By the blood of his cross. So the death of the Son of God, the blood of the cross, the blood shed, human blood, the death of a human being named Jesus, in whom the fullness of God dwelt, that was God's delight. He was delighted and pleased to take up residence in a human body and to experience a human death on a cross to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven. And that raises an interesting question. What does he mean by reconciling all things? Because there sure seems to be a lot of hostility against God remaining in the world. And even in the end, even as we read through the book of Revelation and we come to the end, we know that God will cast many many multitudes into the lake of fire for their continued rebellion and hostility against God. So what is this reconciliation of all things? Well, there are two sides to reconciliation. There are two sides to making peace. You can make peace in two different ways. And you can do it even at the same time in the same event. You can make peace with an, so just imagine for just a moment two opposing nations coming to war with one another. The armies are set in their battle array. They're coming against each other. They're out on the battlefield. They're ready to fight. Peace could happen at that point if the one army surrenders, lays down their arms, and gives themselves over to the power of the other king, the other army, right? So making peace could be that people surrender their arms. But peace also comes after bloody, destructive warfare. So that peace comes at the edge of a sword. Peace comes in the destruction of an enemy. Putting down a rebellion. Peace, in the context of warfare, has to do with the war being over. The conflict being ended. And it can end in one of two ways. One side gives up their rebellion against the true and rightful king, or they are defeated by the one true and rightful king. And what Paul is saying here is that both of those things have happened in the death of Jesus. The war has been won. The war has been won. And those of us who trust in Jesus, those of us who believe in him, we are those who have laid down our arms. We have turned away from our rebellion. We've repented and we've joined up 
with Jesus as our commanding officer, if you will. Those who remain in rebellion against Jesus, against God, will end their rebellion one day. And they will face judgment for their opposition and their hostility against God. The cross has come. Jesus has died on the cross so that sinners, rebels, could have a way of escape from their own doom. The war is over. The war has been won. Victory is complete. Satan, his fallen angels, and all those in re- all those human beings in rebellion against God will will one day stop their fighting. But if they don't do it before Jesus returns, if they don't do it before Judgment Day, they will face the judgment of God for their continued rebellion. Whereas Jesus has offered himself as a sacrifice, taking the judgment of God in himself for those who would trust him. And so the call is from passages like this that we would lay down our arms, that we would cease hostilities, that we would bow in submission to the great God who's offered a way of escape by his mercy. And so that's the, that's the plea on the table from a passage like this, a poem given over to the praise and the, of the supremacy of Jesus. He is preeminent. He is worth all worship and all adoration and all devotion. And so the question on the table is, are you devoted to this one? Look at who he is. He is preeminent whether you acknowledge it or not. The call is for you to see it for yourself, for you to acknowledge that he is supreme and that his way is the right way and that there is an opportunity on the table right now to yield, to submit, and to follow him, and to take up his cross, and to take up his way of living in this world, and to experience the fullness of joy. That's what's offered. Fullness of joy forever and ever and ever. Now, in this world, as Jesus said, you will have tribulation. There will be suffering in this world. But, if you find yourself committed to this Savior, if you find yourself willing to lay down your arms and stop your hostility, not only are you guaranteed that the suffering will end someday, but you're also promised help for today that you can endure and walk through the suffering that is guaranteed in this life with joy, peace, and hope. And that's what's offered to us today in a passage like this. We want to exalt Jesus in our lives. And that's what this passage is here to help us do. Give us language for understanding just how great he is. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for all that you've done to show us his greatness, his supremacy, his preeminence. Would you help us to feel the weight of his importance, of his glory? And would you help us to continually yield ourselves to his ways and to his priorities? Would you help us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Help us to live out that righteousness in our everyday lives. Thank you that by your grace you have offered an opportunity to receive the verdict of righteousness from you even though we are still sinners. Thank you for sending your Son to pay for our sins and our failures. For us whom you have had, for, for us whom you have adopted into your family, would you help us to repent, to continually repent from our sin? Would you help us to see the wonder of what Jesus has done for us? Would you help us to magnify him in our day-to-day lives? It's for his sake we pray. Amen.